where somehow I didn't see her after the show and she hadn't paid me. And she called me up the next day and she said, oh, I, I owe you $2 from last night. And I said, let's just let that ride. She still <laughs> owes me the $2. <laughs> Hello, people of the world. Welcome back to another episode of Sam's Sessions. Special day is always back here. You got the world's worst interviewer as your host. And to my right, a good friend, Gerf Morlix. World's worst guest. <laughs> you know, people have said that before, and and it, as of yet, it hasn't been true. So yeah. hopefully we'll keep on that, that upward Pro trajectory. Probably the same with the interviewer part. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So how are you doing today? I'm doing fine. I'm happy to be here. Good it's deal. It's a beautiful Austin spring day. Yeah, yeah. Are you ready for the, the summertime? Ah, I live for the summertime. Do you really? Yeah, I like the heat. Interesting. That's kind of rare to hear. You don't mind it, I, huh? I very much prefer 100 to 70 yeah. Well, I'm sure I've met you before. I grew up in this shop, um, and I, I'm not very good at remembering faces, but I do recognize you, of course. And uh, are you, you're you in your 70s now, aren't you? Yeah. I'm that's very almost, hard to tell. Almost 72 now. That's really hard to tell just based off the interaction I've already had with you. Um, you definitely have a, a good energy about you. What do you, you drink a bunch of coffee? What's your secret? <sighs> I've never had a cup of coffee in my life. So maybe that's what um, it is. But I feel 25, you know, I mean, I can't yeah. do what I used to do, but I feel like I'm 25 inside. Yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I only know that just doing research. Um, you know, I saw the year you were born, of course. And, um, yeah, I'm, I'm impressed, man. I, I hope I can act the way you act when I'm 50. We'll see. Well, I'm... I'm lucky to be here, first of all. Yeah, right. I'm extremely lucky to be here. I might not have been, and and I am. So yeah. Good so there's deal. that. I'm, I'm thankful for that every day. Good. Yeah. That's um, Ray Wiley Hubbard, who I know you've worked with. His yeah. uh, his quote is the days I keep my expectations lower than my gratitude. Yeah. Something like that. I have pretty good days. Yeah. That's uh, that's a good one to live by for sure. Yeah. That's a that's a great quote, and he's a, he's an extremely. Uh, advanced human being yeah. in his way. Yeah, no doubt. So uh, the first thing I wanted to bring up, um, I know you were born in Buffalo, New York, and you moved to Texas, something that seemed like 18 years later. You must have been 18 or in your early 20s. Uh, yeah, well, let's see. I was, it was early 75, so I was 24. 24. Okay, so I'm 23 yeah. now. I can't imagine moving to a, another state, let alone pretty much across the country. What drew you to Texas at that age? Well, I was in Buffalo, and there was I, I wanted to play music. I wanted to play um, country music and rock and roll. I started playing pedal steel, and but I I wanted to rock out too, and, mm -hmm. uh, and I couldn't find anybody anybody around Buffalo uh, enough enough people around there that wanted to do that to start a band. Yeah, and I was talking to a drummer friend who I really liked and liked his playing and and he went to see Commander Cody in Buffalo and okay. he said where should we go to play country music and rock and roll and uh, Commander said Austin or Boston yeah. so we just started looking at Austin and uh, I remember we wrote to the um, Chamber of Commerce yeah and they sent us like three or four pages out of the out of the yellow pages in an envelope, they mailed them to us, and it was nightclubs. <laughs> it's like, well, there was like eight or ten nightclubs in Buffalo, and there was uh -huh. 70 in Austin. And, wow. And that was in 75, you know. Wow. So we just drove down here unannounced, and uh, and it was perfect. And within like two or three weeks, we were both in bands, mm -hmm. making a great living. Uh, rent was dirt cheap. Yeah. There was no traffic, you know. My rent... My rent was fifty three dollars a month, sharing a oh, no. sharing a three bedroom house. Wow, wow! Yeah, oh, it, no. it's it's not quite like that now. No, it's, it's still great, but it's not like it was. Yeah, it sounds like a freaking utopia when people talk about Austin back in the day. Well, you know, now for for someone who's twenty three, twenty four, there's nowhere to go to to live cheap in a nice, warm college town with mm -hmm. great restaurants. There is nowhere in the States to do that. Yeah. Like everywhere that's nice is really expensive now. For sure. And I, I guess I was just lucky, you know. Mm -hmm, Picked mm -hmm. the right spot. And 
Um, you talked about living in L.A. Uh, you were out in L.A. and you were playing with Lucinda Williams' band. Is that correct? Yeah. And so how long were you in L.A. playing with them for? Well, um, I was out there for 13 years. Wow. I met her a few years into that. And um, I ended up playing with her for 11 years. Um, met her out there and just kind of got into her band, which mm -hmm. had already sort of was forming. And first I was the bass player, and then I became the guitar player. And, and uh, you know, we would do these gigs around Hollywood. I remember there was one where somehow I didn't see her after the show, and she hadn't paid me. And she called me up the next day, and she said, oh, I, I owe you $2 from last night. I said, let's just let that ride. She still owes me the $2. <laughs> but that's the kind of gigs we're playing, you know? They're yeah. $8 for the whole band. It's like that around here now, I guess, sometimes, you know? It can be, for sure. Yeah. I was, uh, of course, researching for this interview and uh, saw how expansive your career is. You researched? Uh, yeah, a little bit, man. You told me you bit. were the world's worst interviewer. Uh, you know, that's just to set the bar low. You know, <laughs> I don't want to get set anyone's expectations high. You know, it's like what Ray, Ray Wiley Hubbard said. But um, yeah, your your career goes on forever, um, and you have some really cool accolades too. Like to to, to name a few would be um, you're a member of the Austin Music Hall of Fame, the Buffalo Music Hall of Fame. Uh, you won the Americana Music Association Best Instru Instrumentalist Year. Uh, that was in 2009. So you have these really cool accolades. I'm curious, do any of them? stick out above the rest yeah it's it's not really about awards for me you know i just mm -hmm. i just want to write songs and record them right and uh and you know it's and part of it is just that i've been around so long it's like they're gonna give you a watch you know <laughs> just, yeah it's, they, they feel indebted somehow mm -hmm. and that's fine but it's you know the, there's no best yeah. You know, we just, we just, we're hopefully all, we're just making some art, you know? Yeah. That's cool. That's a good way to look at it. I feel if you chase after awards, then uh, you're never going to really get what you're looking for. Yeah. It's, it's, there's no best. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I like that. Um, what was your experience like when you worked with uh, Robert Earl Keane and you produced his album? Ah, he was great. Yeah. Uh, he still is, I'm sure. Um, He's he was the only person that uh, promised me that he would have the songs on the first day of recording. Oh wow! And as a, as a producer, I always had to hear the songs first, and I get an idea of the album in my head. Mm -hmm. And he kept saying, "Don't worry, I'll get them." And I said, "Well, you know, I've never trusted anyone to do that before, <laughs> but I'll I'll give you a shot here." And he showed up with like ten or twelve mm -hmm. really great songs on the first day of recording. And wow. And he just came through, and then he said, uh, "And you know, I did a, two or three records with him, two records, I guess." Okay. Um, and he, then he said, uh, "Oh, I asked him. I said, you know, if you'd have had to do a double album, he said, I, I he had a little trailer on mm -hmm. his property somewhere. He goes, I just went in there and wrote the songs. It took him like a week or three, four days or something. Wow. Very odd. And and I said, you know, if you'd have had to do a double album and you had like, you know." Eight days? Could you have written a double album? He goes, "Yeah, I think so." That's crazy. And and he writes really well under pressure. Mm -hmm. And I, I've never known anyone else like that. Right. Yeah, I was gonna ask, how does that uh, how does that differ from your writing process? Because, ah, uh, well, I just I write them when they show up. I try every night. Right. I sit down late at night. That's that's when uh, my better ideas come. The mm -hmm. filters go down and the antenna go up, and I I just kind of, but I I pick up my guitar and I'll just try every night, and if I don't get something, I'll go to something I've already written and try to pound it into shape and mm -hmm. make it better, um, and lots of times there's nothing there. Yeah, um, and you just got to keep waiting for it to come. Yeah, that's interesting. And then you know once you get the the spark, then it's the then you have to craft it, you have to beat it into submission and. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I've gotten better at that, or I've gotten faster at that. Yeah. Well, it's it's interesting because, uh, like, I, I was on your website, and uh, underneath your mission statement, I'll, I'll just go ahead and paraphrase it, but underneath your mission statement, you, you wrote, you said, I care about the songs, which are my babies. I care so much about the sound. I obsess over the recording process more than you will ever know. 
And then you go on to say that you used to just get them to the point where they rhymed and didn't sound stupid, and then you would call them done. And you've learned a lot from the amazing songwriters that you've gotten to work with over the years. And so it seems like you've kind of gone, you know, where maybe you started at this point where the song would come to you, you'd put it together, this is good, done. Yeah, yeah, call it Whereas now you're more obsessive over it and more of a perfectionist. You know... All the people who tell me they wrote a song in 30 minutes, you know, they maybe they got the idea in 30 minutes, but they, you know, people like Billy Joe Shaver, you know, mm -hmm. he just, he would claim to be a country boy and just, he said, I just make these things up, you know, but uh, I could tell he crafts those really well because right. he's a master. And uh, I remember reading a Leonard Cohen interview. There's mm -hmm. a book called Songwriters on Songwriting. Okay. By a guy named Paul Zola. That's really, really good. And he interviewed everybody from F Frank Zappa to Towns Van Zandt to uh, Paul Simon. It's 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 really great book. And uh, reading the Leonard Cohen uh, interview, and Leonard Cohen is an amazing songwriter. I mean, there's no there's no argument there. You think mm -hmm. you know, Hallelujah is like a perfect song, you know. And mm -hmm. I don't need to hear it again right now, but uh, <laughs> but. <laughs> It's it's a perfect song, oh, and man. he asked he was asking Leonard about verses and how, and rewriting and how many verses he wrote, and Leonard said, you know that um, song "Democracy Is Coming to the USA." Um, he said, here's here's a couple of verses that I took out of it, and he recited the verses, and the interviewer said. Holy shit, those are great verses. And Leonard said, I took out 54 more. That's how that's how hard he works on those songs. Wow. And, you know, Lucinda used to tell me when I was working with her and producing her records, and she said most people's problem is that they just don't know when their song is finished. Mm -hmm. And it's got to be perfect. Right. I mean, it's got to be as perfect as you can make it. It's, you know, you go for the spark, but then you got to... You got to really um, hone it mm -hmm. and, and rewrite and just try to try to make it uh, undeniably great. How do you know when the song's done? Yeah, that's tough. Yeah, um, I think I've I've either gotten more forgiving or I've gotten faster at it. Yeah, is it is it tough to find the balance between like trying to perfect a song? And just getting the song out. Because I've talked to musicians before where it almost seems like um, being a perfectionist has almost held them back at certain times. Whereas it would have been better to just throw it out there. Or like with Scott, you know, like spending too much time on one song. I spent a lot of time yeah. like crafting and it, it's, it's held me back for like, it held me back on one album for like a year and a half. Right. So do you well, have to, do you try and find that balance or, or does it more just like flow for you? You just got to find the flow somehow. Mm -hmm. You know, there are people who are brilliant songwriters who have never released an album. And, you know, there are people who, who I'm familiar with who have been working for more than 30 years on their second album. <laughs> and it's just, you know, it's a, you have to, you have to let it go somehow if you think it's good. Uh, it's, I don't, you just got to find it in you somehow. Yeah. And it's the same with writing or whatever. It's right. just, you have to be, you have to have, find some satisfaction. Yeah, of course. How long did you play guitar with uh, Warren Zevon? Uh, well, I toured with him for, it was three months in 1990. It was a three month tour. Okay. Um, I was playing guitar and bass and lap steel, and mandolin. And uh, it was, it was great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, where did the tour go? Was it national? Or? All over, yeah. It was uh, all over the States and Canada. Wow. Um, it was amazing. Uh, Warren was a genius. Yeah. And an extremely unique individual. More um, more concentrated energy in that person than anyone I've ever seen. Wow. And he was great to me. I saw him be pretty horrible to some other people. <laughs> uh, but he treated me really well. Well, that's what's and, important. Yeah. Yeah. Um but he he was he was a genius. Right. You know, he when he was a teenager, he knew Stravinsky and would go over to his house. What? Yeah. Okay. Wow. Forgive grew my up, ignorance. Grew up in so, Southern California. So, so, you already know what I'm going to ask. Well, who is Stravinsky? Yeah. So Stravinsky is a is a um how would you, how would you I guess cuz it, it was classical and romantic and then 
Oh God, I wish uh, forget the the term of modern classical music, but it. He's a, a composer. Yeah, he's yeah. Yeah, a, 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 a composer, but it was like after, like basically, he, he was one of the composers that just like broke. New he, ground. He broke new ground. Well, essentially, he yeah. wrote these amazing ballets um, and pieces that went to these ballets, but one of them was, in particular was called The Ride of Spring. And yeah. essentially, that was like 1920 something or other on its debut, inside, like that performance of it incited mm-hmm. a riot. Oh, what? Yeah. Uh, he okay. was he was he was he was the pinnacle. You know, he was yeah. up there. He's you know he's one of the greatest of all time. Yes, wow, yes, he is, is an amazing composer. Yeah. And he yeah, but there, because the whole thing about the Rite of Spring, it was it was a piece that was basically written off of Russian paganistic rituals. So they essentially pick a virgin and have her dance to death. Oh my gosh! To, 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 to their pagan god. So it's a, it's a whole it's a whole ballet of this woman dancing herself to death. And you can see why Warren was interested in Stravinsky. Yes. <laughs> That's crazy. That's wild. And so he knew him when he was a teenager? Yeah. Wow. And, and Stravinsky cool. apparently saw something in Warren and and welcomed him to come over and talk music. And, mm-hmm. and they did. That's, in, that's interesting. Did he yeah. have any cool stories to tell you about Stravinsky? Uh, no, he just told me that he did that. Yeah. You know, he wasn't much of a name dropper, uh-huh. uh, although he could certainly do that. Right. He had a lot of famous friends. Um, you know, what I what I really appreciated about him was that no one could write songs like that. Uh-huh. And some of his songs are as good as anybody's songs. Right. You know, as good as Dylan's songs. And, mm-hmm. you know, Dylan was playing Warren Zevon songs <laughs> when Warren was dying. And since then, you know, yeah. it's like there's... You know, there's no one else can write those songs. It's like it's like Ray Wiley. It's like no one else can write the songs that Ray Wiley is writing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you know, there's there's something to be said for that. Of course, of course, yeah. I'm. Uh, it's really cool. You've got to have these experiences with these people, and um, you know, like people say, great minds think alike. So it definitely speaks to your your testament being able to hang around those people. Well, I've been lucky. Yeah, lucky and talented though. Talented yeah, too. Yeah, but. Lucky to to have them let me hang out around with them. Yeah, of course, of course. So, um, and I don't. Uh, you've been releasing albums like uh, like you wouldn't believe. I know you wrote a whole bunch of them during lockdowns, and you've still been writing since. Yeah, the songs really didn't stop coming. They've slowed down a little bit now. Mm-hmm. Uh, I spent the last six weeks chainsawing from the ice storm, <laughs> not <laughs> yeah. writing. Um, yeah, but. Uh, they just started coming like, like usually I would get eight songs a year or something. Wow. And suddenly I would, I had like 30. That's great. Like it's in, something in, like in like 2020. I think I wrote like 30 songs or it's something. It's something like seven albums since 2020, right? Yeah. Well, I put out, uh, I got a new one coming out April 1st, which is okay. coming right up. Okay. A few days. And what's that called? Uh, it's called I Challenge the Beast. Yeah. And that was yeah. that's what you're talking about on the website right there at the top. And that one seems really yeah. exciting. And so um, I released uh, Kiss of the Diamond back in 2020 and uh, Tightening of the Screws in mm-hmm. 2021 and then Caveman in 2022 and now this one. And I've got so many, so many, I have four more finished. And another six songs on the fifth one. Wow. So uh, a couple of weeks ago, I was finishing a mix, and I just looked at I used to. Th- I used to think that uh, I could only release an album every year and a half mm-hmm. because I knew people that would release every year, and I just wasn't ready for their album at that point. I was still uh, digging the last one, you know? Mm-hmm. And, mm-hmm. and uh, But now I got so many. I, I finished this mix, and I looked at the schedule, and I thought, well, you know, if I— if I do this every year, if I do one a year, it's going to be five years before this song comes out. Yeah. And that just seemed ridiculous. So I'm, uh, I put out Caveman in October, and I now April 1st is uh, I Challenge the Beast. I'm on the Beatles schedule of two albums a year. <laughs> I, gotta, I just had to unclog the pipeline. So. Yeah, yeah. It's cool. It's just it's really, really cool to see that kind of work ethic. Um, and also, you know, there's no rules anymore. It's mm-hmm. like, you know, the... The pandemic changed everything. You know? I saw so, you note that too. He said yeah. all, all the rules have been upended. Yeah, yep. fences was, are down. the The way you wrote your mission statement was actually like 
kind of inspiring in a way. Good. I don't know if like it was it was almost like when you see those inspirational people like talking on podcasts, you know, about like working out, but like you know, you were talking about like writing music and the way you did it, it like you know, it's like I would read that first thing in the morning when I wake up and just get pumped up for the day kind cool. of deal. I, I I wrote that thing and then I showed it to somebody and they said, oh, don't put that on there. That sounds terrible. I go, no. <laughs> and then I, I put it on there and everybody said, we love that. Yeah, so, I, I couldn't disagree more. I think yeah. that's I think it was it was amazing. And uh, it it's. It shows your voice through it too. Um, that's in a way. That's which is all cool. we can hope for, you know. We're we're as a, as a writer, any any type of artist is just trying to let people know who they are. Mm-hmm. Of course, just show your personality, and hopefully, you have one. No, oh, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, you better if you're gonna, yeah, yeah. make it for sure. Um, which definitely, it's fair to say you do. So, the album I'm most familiar with, as far as your recent albums go, would be Caveman. Uh-huh. Um, and I picked out three songs. It's hard to, I'm very, very indecisive, but I I forced myself to pick out three songs that I thought were the most intriguing to me. And I want to see if you, one, either agree with the top three that I chose, and and then second, if you have any kind of stories or reasoning behind writing the songs. Okay. Um, So let's see. The first one would be uh, I Dig Your Crazy Brain. That one is, uh, that one's super cool to me because... I like crazy women, you know, and yeah. uh, I think a lot of people can can. Uh... I I've always been drawn to weirdos. Yeah, um, and I, I want to be able to limit my exposure, uh-huh. but I, I I'm drawn to personality and and yeah. and people that are out there. Mm-hmm. And, it's oddly relatable, you know. Yeah, you just have to be able to get away sometimes, you know. <laughs> but but yeah, I, I like that song a lot, and and you know the whole, the whole deal with Caveman was. Um, you know, most of my songs are just so introspective and mm-hmm. people say they're dark. Mm. I don't see them that way, but uh, but they must be right, I guess. But I wanted to uh, I wanted to just do a kind of a fun rock and roll album. Yeah. And, uh, I, you know, I really like some old songs like She's About a Mover and Wooly mm-hmm. Bully and, mm-hmm. and uh, Surfer Bird. Yeah. Surfing Bird. Uh, just I like I like rock and roll nonsense songs, and I just kind of mm. wanted to just to lighten up a little bit and just yeah. do a record of, of dumbbell rock and roll songs. Something to just have a lot of fun with. Yeah, and it kind of ended up I think halfway between that and what I normally do, but it was it right. was a, it was a bit of a departure for sure. Well, and so then the next one, um, 1959. Uh, the song 1959. I was born in 1999, uh, and I don't I, like. I've seen the movie The Outsiders. That might be my best idea of you know, and, and I'm pretty sure that takes place in the 60s or the 70s. I don't know that film. It's a it's an old film. It was a book that adapted into a film. But essentially, what I'm trying to say is, I don't have a very good idea of what things were like back in the very late 50s, and the imagery you used in that song and the, the way you wrote that song, like kind of took me there, which I was really impressed with because I do read and never once have felt that I'm like really in in that time period. And uh, you did a really good job of that with that song. Well, thanks. Uh, that song got uh, the best response of any songs on that album. Did it really? Yeah. Wow. Um, uh, kind of using it universally. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, it was post-war. Um, everything, you know, the baby boom. Mm-hmm. Uh, everything was just happening then it was the golden age right and uh yeah and yeah. also you know like as i think back on it now you know you could park in front of any business you wanted to go into for free <laughs> <laughs> and that's gone now here in austin and many for other sure. places you know and for it's sure. um and just the you know the creativity that after the war which was so horrible mm-hmm. worse than anything that i've gone through or you've gone through or hopefully will ever go through mm-hmm. um People came out of that, and it was just you know the the burst of babies and the burst of art yeah. and everything that I list in that song, and I left out you know like way more than I put in. Really, it was so much great stuff happened, and not just particularly 1959, but that you know, mm-hmm. well, I mean, just think about a 1959 Les Paul, you know. Yeah. First of all, that was that was the inspiration. You know what? Wow. What what makes that the pinnacle? You know. Yeah. Um. But all you, the all the films, all the all the books, all the you know mm-hmm. everything that came out then was just a it was just the flowing. 
I would almost like recommend it to a history teacher if they're like in if they're teaching about that piece of history, like play that song. Yeah. You know, it's a it's a way way more fun way to hear about that period of time than than a textbook for sure. And you know, it's interesting. You said it was one of the most positive uh, responses out of all the songs. I think I would think that that has a lot to do with uh, like technology is so overloaded and and it's in everything we do now. I mean, this would be a great conversation to have off camera, you know. But it's sure. like. Now all the conversations need to be on camera and yeah. the phones are completely taking over everything. It's almost like people are just longing for that, you know, that time yeah. before technology took us over. Well, it was the golden age. It was it yeah. was really remarkable. It was it was like, you know, the the clouds cleared and the sun came out. It was Yeah. For like ten years. That's awesome. That's super cool. Well, I recommend everyone go listen to that. Um, yeah. Because yeah, I like that one a lot, and I, I like uh, what you had to say about it. The other one would be, uh, the third one would be Snake Pit. Ah. That one was like, kind of seemed, uh, as far as like the rest of them go and the rest of them sound, seemed like really unique and almost like an outlier. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what to say about Snake Pit. It's just, it's a catchy little, mm -hmm. little dark thing. You know, I've, I was always fascinated by... Um, sleaze mm -hmm. and you know there was a county fair that came to my town every summer and I would go there and sneak in I'd crawl under the tent of the freak show and just see these things that you know my parents had no idea I was witnessing <laughs> and, and so I've always been drawn to that kind wow. of a thing and uh, mm -hmm. and that just and then I like the kind of the juxtaposition of the little happy dumbbell rock and roll beat with it you know mm -hmm. it's just, it's, it's so, just it did it for me somehow yeah of course so you went to real freak shows back in the day yeah that's crazy yeah do you know like the, the weirdest thing you saw at one of those uh well you know my mom told me about going to a freak show when she was a kid and there was an actual geek what's a, a geek a geek was a person a person who would sit there in a pen with a bunch of lizards and snakes and just bite into them and spit blood out and wow you know, it was really freaky and wow and so i didn't see that but i saw people sitting in pits with snakes and picking them up and looking at them and that's crazy you know it was you know that was back in the 30s when mm -hmm. she was see 20s and 30s mm -hmm. yeah i've read about freak shows and um i've read about like really really dark kind of horrifying ones and i've read about some that seemed like really kind of magical and uh they kind of just like go all over the place but yeah you ever heard uh um, Bob Dylan's song, uh, um, Something's Happening and You Don't Know What It Is, Do You, Mr. Jones? Mm -mm. Uh, well, you should listen to that. And uh, there's a verse in there about going to a geek. Really? Seeing the geek. and That's, yeah, uh, that's it's, interesting. It's, it's evocative. It gives, a, it gives Geek Squad a whole new... <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, because yeah, when you said yeah. geek, I, that's exactly what I was thinking. I should have realized that. Yeah, right? It's, well, it's just cool because it almost... Th those almost seem like a, a work of fiction to me, rather than something that uh, was actually going on. It's pretty yeah. sweet. Anyhow, it was it was low down, and you know, I'd I'd there was there was a couple of strip shows on the on the midway. There was a white one and a black one, and like the bands would come out and play for like ten minutes out in front of the uh, the the strip club trailer or whatever. It was a tent, you know, mm -hmm. with a with a fake front to it but they had a little stage and they would carry their amps and drums out there and play and first time i ever saw a black band and they i remember they played the song memphis and i went wow you know i was like 12 yeah that's that's what i want to do you know? <laughs> uh, it was it was low down and then um when i took my wife back to that town this was in the early 80s i guess and uh I said, wait till we go to the fair. You're not going to believe it. You know, it's so low down and it had completely cleaned up. Really? And the sleaziest thing they had was pig races. And even that was, there was no sleaze at all. It had just been made PC. And, oh, wow. You know, it was disappointing. Yeah, it's kind of a bummer. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I would have, uh, if I had a time machine, you know, I'll leave Hitler alone. I just want to go see the freak shows, you know? Well, there's you know there's there's movies and books and yeah, well and that's what I've seen. That's and yeah. but it just it seemed so, you know, like a work of fiction to me rather than something that was yeah. actually going on. It's that's really cool. Um, okay, so for the next part of the show, I'm gonna jump to this or that questions. Okay. So um, less so catered to you and more so random and uh, kind of rapid fire. 
Um, we'll start with you can live in any city or have a, a farmhouse in any state. Which one are you choosing? Uh, you got to be near a city. Got to be near a city. Yeah, I've got never it. I've never really much lived in town mm-hmm. or in a downtown. I've never lived in a downtown. But I you know I love New York. I love the crazy energy in New York. Um, but I'd have to be yeah a half an hour or an hour out of town. Always live just close enough. Yeah. Debit or credit? Um, credit. I don't know what debit is. <laughs> uh, I know this one, I think. Night owl or morning person? Oh, night owl. Yeah, that's where you get all your ideas, huh? Yeah. That's a lot cool. of people, um, their ideas come in the morning. You know, mm-hmm. A lot of writers get up and write before mm-hmm. anything else happens. And I like the quiet after midnight when it just, there's nobody up and it's... yeah. You know what my problem is, is I'm kind of the same way where, uh, you know, it seems like after 11 p.m. my brain actually wakes up for the day. But I was raised to being where like, you know, once it's nighttime, it's time to like relax and go to bed. So my brain will finally wake up, but I'm like inundated and like watching TV instead of like, you know, trying to be creative. Yeah. I need to get out of that. Well, you can do that. Yeah, for sure. Sorry, it's an interesting thing. Kind of just hit me. That's okay. (laughs) 80s or 90s? Uh, 60s. Yeah? Yeah. There you go. Hell yeah. Uh, 70s. 70s, I'm sorry, the worst decade ever. Yeah. (laughs) As far as fashion, cars, Mm -hmm. any of it, and music, and yeah, Mm -hmm. 60s was that too, but... Um, I just thought the 70s was the worst, followed by the 80s and the 90s and the double knots and the teens. <laughs> <laughs> it's just all been downhill since uh, the 60s. No, it's coming back a little. Yeah? It just it took a big dip after the 60s, and it's trying to slowly work its way back up. The technology is amazing. Yeah. That's really helping. Yeah, for sure. It's crazy. I um. My my phone's like my personal assistant. I you know set reminders on it all the time. I it's, don't think I'd be able to function without it. It's an amazing tool. Yeah, it really it's, is. I mean, I I think that you know maybe you know you realize it, but I think a lot of pe- young people don't realize what it is. You mm-hmm. know, it's it's just there for them. You know, from the time they're born. But man, it's the it's the greatest tool. Yeah. Since the wheel. Yeah, I I, I abuse it yeah. for sure. That's an interesting way to put it. Greatest tool since the wheel. So yeah, it's very true. Um. Okay, let's see here. Do you have a favorite conspiracy theory? Uh, Don't go into them at all? Anything I can't ever know about, there's no sense in me spending any time thinking about it. Yeah, you got better things to put your mind to, it seems like, for sure. I like that. Um, Let's see. Big venue or small? Small. Yeah. I like talking to everybody that wants to talk to me. Yeah, it's nice and intimate. Yeah. That's good. I used to be really shy and... uh, you know, when I first started playing solo gigs, I didn't even want to go out of the dressing room and talk to people. And people are going, no, you got to go talk to them. And I thought, no, I don't want to talk to them. And then I went out and talked to them and I found out that I loved it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, of course. I mean, you guys are definitely connected by something that's important to you. So Yeah. It's yeah. it's a, it's about community and communication and mm-hmm, for sure. small venues. Gurf, I can't thank you enough for doing this with us today. Oh, thanks, Seth. It was fun. That was a great time. I really appreciate you coming in. Cool. Man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Awesome. And uh, check out I Challenge the Beast. Yeah. Yeah. yeah April please. 1st. April Fools. Yeah. April Fools. It's, that's it's be a good available one. now, but okay. at the website, you know. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Sounds good.